Okay, so let's get started on behalf of EV Reporter and HBK World. I welcome you all to this webinar on advanced testing solutions for EV battery packs and motors. We are glad to have professionals across the electric vehicle ecosystem, including OEMs, powertrain and EV component companies, uh, battery solution providers joining us for this event. We hope that today's technical presentations on testing solutions for EV motors and structural durability of EVs and battery packs will provide you with valuable insights. So let me quickly take you through the event agenda and speaker introductions. So we will start with a short introduction to HBK from Mr. Prakash Stephen, Director of Sales at HBK India. Then we'll move on to our first technical presentation on advancements in motor testing for production by Mitch Marks, who is a business development manager at HBK. His presentation will cover advancements in, bat in mot motor technology, the failure modes that can be expected in a motor, and how to test for these different failures for, for production. After that, we have a technical presentation on structural durability of electric vehicles and battery packs by Christopher Salcher, International Product Manager, Test and Measurement, and Thomas Kemmerich, Technical Manager, Europe at HBK World. This presentation will discuss structural durability validation from material classification, FEA-based lifetime simulation, or virtual testing to structural durability testing. And towards the end, we'll have a Q&A session where our experts will answer some of your questions. So before I invite Prakash for a company introduction, we'll play a short video from HPK that is focused on the electrification solutions. Prakash, over to you for company introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Prakash Stephen. I'm the sales director for HPK in India. I've been associated with uh, HBM for the last 22 years. And uh, today we are here, thanks to Prayakshi and EV Reporter, we are trying to uh, tell about the durability and motor advanced testing solutions that we see in the market for and what solutions we can present to you from HPK. So I will be talking for a few minutes, five minutes uh, regarding HPK and then uh, Mitch Marks, our uh, electrification specialist will be talking about motor testing advancements that we have and uh, Christoph and Thomas, uh, who are into durability measure, measurements will be talking about the hardware side and the software side of durability measurements. To talk about us, who is HBK? So um, BNK and HBM are two 75 old companies who were reputed in their respective fields for static measurement and sound and vibration measurement and durability measurements. They came together in 2019 to form a global powerhouse in test and measurement landscape. Yeah. We serve around 35,000 customers as HBK now and span to around 50 plus countries worldwide. In India, 
HPK has around 60 employees working in sales, service, and product testing. We are headquartered in Chennai and have sales engineers in Chennai, Bangalore, Pune, and Delhi. Um, HBK in India has had a CAGR growth of approximately 12.5-13% over the from 2016 when we came in directly here. So what we see is customers are challenged more and more today than ever before to accelerate product development and come into the market fast. Um, this is our number one priority um, that we have. So to do this, we have to innovate or empower the innovators. And our vision as such is to empower the innovators to create a cleaner, healthier, and more productive world by bringing together exceptional sensing insights and elevating their customers' confidence in their data. So we uh, try to empower the innovators. That's our main vision and goal. Uh, how do we do this? We focus on areas which match our customers' product lifecycle phases, be it uh, virtual testing, physical testing, or when a product is being made quality or in process, and then after a quarter, product is made an asset optimization or uh, monitoring of the assets. So we are working with our customers completely in R&D and in production and reliability after that. So we support our customers through the complete product life cycle from the very idea that they have and how to get a pro final product and manufacture that product. So you could see it from fatigue, uh, so fatigue life softwares and uh, failure mode analysis softwares from uh, ENCODE, the ENCODE software. And then uh, from uh, VI grade solutions that we have, simulators and real, uh, real time computing. And then to do the physical testing itself in and production and in operation, we have scores of sensors from acceleration, force, microphones, and then the data acquisitions and softwares that go along with them. So it is not in one domain that we are. We are there in mechanical domain where you measure the strain, load, force, torque, displacement in the time domain. Also in the frequency domain, we have solutions where you measure the noise, sound power, acoustics, uh, vibrations, and also in the electrical domain where you want to measure voltages, currents, speed, temperatures. So you see all the three uh, domains where uh, the physical, electrical, and sound and vibration, we have solutions that we can offer the customer. So as far as the sensors goes, we make our own sensors. So right from the strain gauges and force sensors for durability, fatigue testing, center of gravity measurements, drop tests, or accelerometers for vibration testing, model shock testing, microphones for cabin noise, component noise, noise source identification, pass by noise, current sensors for electrical power analysis, torque sensors for mechanical power analysis. Today, we'll, or we would be seeing a part of that where we can measure uh, torque and power, power distributions and drivetrain uh, measurements. Then thermocouples again for your uh, battery uh, thermal integrity measurements and e-drive testing, fiber optics for your battery measurements again, and then smart sensors where you can put it in your product on a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler in product solutions. So customized in product solutions, we do deliver. On the, uh, data acquisition side, we have various systems which can cater to various application needs of a customer. So uh, where if it is going to be in a lab-based environment, we have our distributed quantum mix systems. If it is going to be in a ruggedized on-road acquisition systems, RLDAs, fit, uh, 
break testing, then we have our SOMAT XR systems. If it's going to be lab-based electrical measurements, then we have our Genesis systems. If it's going to be NVH measurements, then we have our pulse systems. The MGC and CAN heads are basically meant for large channel phones, 4,000, 5,000 channels for aerospace measurements. Uh, fiber sensing for asset monitoring and uh, yeah, for electric um, fiber optic measurements. And if you see that there are many systems in the market and what we are also bringing out is trying to come back with the durability and NVH system with our fusion system. One system which can do durability as well as NVH systems, NVH measurements. And on the software side, we have simulation and analysis software. So right from simulation to data acquisition via Catman and BAK Connect, and then going into analysis with uh, Encode Glyphworks. And if you want to do collaborative work, then we have the Aquera software. So um, our goal as such is to deliver one integrated solution. If you see today, as I showed you uh, a few slides back, we have many data acquisition systems and sensors. We produce high measurement quality systems uh, for R&D, end of line testing, and in product testing. Where we are moving towards to a tomorrow is a unified platform, like uh, I was showing with a fusion, where you have durability, NVH, uh, electrical, all in one, completely synchronized. Of course, all our current systems also can be synchronized via PTPs, but here, one system which can look into any of the different kinds of thing where you can compare your simulation results and test data results in a single platform and also build an ecosystem for the benefit of third party connections so we are work we are uh, working on that and we are high on priority on that so we want other people to connect to our systems so that they can make use of our ecos uh, ecosystem so that's as far as our uh, goal and goals. So before I hold you up for the more interesting part, uh, which comes up, so I'd like to end with a note saying that we, HBK, deliver insights and confidence. That is the value that we as HBK provide you to create an outstanding product, that you create a product, okay, and we enable you innovators to uh, get the product going and cut down your time to market and in a digital world. So we see that digital world is the one where we are all working towards and this is changing the whole dynamic of the thing. So we would like to leave you with this insight, how, where we are and how we are going and moreover to Mitch Marks to tell you more on motor testing. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and, and thank you Prakash for the, for the nice introduction. Um, so this is, uh, this is the part of the presentation about um, advanced motor testing for production. So we're gonna look at primarily two things here. We're gonna look at testing motors for faults, failures, um, these types of things, uh, so that we can understand um, what's happening in a production environment. We can test for these things before they get mass produced. So uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Indian team. They're, they're quite great. And I think you'll all look forward to working with them. And with that, I'll jump into some of the interesting stuff. Um, so for a quick agenda, uh, we'll start with an introduction to eDrive. So this is one of HBK's products. It's our motor analysis product. Just so you know what we're talking about, um, and in all of my examples, we've used the eDrive product uh, to do the testing. Um, we're gonna go through the world's briefest overview of motor failures. So we're gonna understand why motors might fail in the field and start to plant the seeds for what we can do to test for this in a production environment. So I'm really pitching you two solutions, one for analyzing the motor in like the R&D and product development, and then another for measurement in production where we can decide, should this go into the field? We're gonna look at an actual failure example. Um, we're gonna go over some complex motor topologies. This might seem to stray a little bit from failures, but when we start looking at the production environment, these new novel motors that these people much smarter than myself um, and, and probably the other presenters today 
have come up with are really, really cool, but also very challenging to test. So we're gonna look at some of the state of the art, maybe what we need to think about in production testing, and then measuring for end of line testing for, for motors. And now there's a picture on the right-hand side of a motor rotor uh, with me taking a lighter to it. This is my hand. Um, if you stick around for the whole presentation, all hundred and something of you guys, um, I will tell you why I was taking a lighter to this motor. Uh, any guesses are welcome in the chat. So let's get into it. Um, so the eDrive product, um, we're, we have a chassis based mainframe. Now this looks like every other data acquisition box you've ever seen, but we have a couple different flavors. So we have a small guy. This is probably the most cost effective. We have a medium sized guy. Um, this is probably what most of you would use. And we also have a large and a largest, and those are more for the aerospace people if there's any in the room. So with these chassis, we have card slots and we put cards in these. So the bigger the chassis, the more cards, the more measurements. And we can actually go up to 51 electrical power measurements. So that's 51 voltages and 51 currents in a common chassis. So we can do quite large systems especially if you're you know, in the mining or the aerospace or, or maybe large equipment, this might be quite relevant. If you're in automotive, we are seeing six phase machines that are coming in. Or if you're looking at things like heavy trucking, um, heavy trucking also is going to you know, maybe six or nine phase motors. So this is, could be a real issue for you having enough channels to do your measurements. Our, um, our measurement system can continuously record data for really as long as you want. This is really important for that fault testing because if it's a fast fault, we might just wanna trigger and get data for a couple seconds. But if we wanna know what leads up to that fault, we wanna know the conditions coming up to it. We wanna store data for a pretty long time before and maybe after to see what led to my failure and then what happens after my failure happens. This is the type of information we're gonna be able to take back to production. So storing data for failure testing is really important. It's important for troubleshooting and all these other things, but for the topics of today, I think this is one of the most important things that HPK can offer. Um, we support up to six torque and speed transducers if you're doing full vehicle type things. Um, so the magic really happens not in the chassis, but in the cards. So you can see this card here will go into this chassis. We support direct up to 1.5 kilovolts. We have a sample rate of two mega samples per second. Again, if we're looking at these kind of fast faults, these fast failures, which we'll speak about, this two mega sample helps us see what's happening in that time domain. These inverters are switching very quickly. You know, we're looking at somewhere in the world of 10 to 20 kilohertz for automotive going even higher with, with new switch technologies. So failures happen quick. So we need the high sample rate to understand that. Uh, we have very high accuracy for electrical power. This allows us to trust our measurements, especially when we're making comparisons, thinking about a pass versus a fail for some of these more advanced situations. High accuracy lets us trust our results. So when we're looking at tolerances, we can just set the tolerance. We don't have to worry about the instrument. Um, our cards have an onboard digital signal processor. We do all of our calculations in discrete time in hardware. What does this do for you? This lets you do really fast feedback to an automation system. When we start talking about production, we want PPM. We, we want to be pushing product out of the door. We can help lower your test time and, and raise that fidelity. Um, HBK has torque transducers and current transducers, really high accuracy. Um, if you wanna be measuring the torque, as, as Prakash mentioned, uh, we can very easily bring that in and are a market leader in torque. We would love to talk to you about torque sensors. And then we can make a variety of other measurements as well. Again, Prakash brought up the whole NVH, the electromechanical environment. Um, with this high-speed data acquisition unit, we can bring in accelerometers, microphones, temperatures, CAN bus, and really high sample rates, so we can start to understand the whole environment. Failures are often electromechanical. We see them as, as a, an electrical problem that leads to a mechanical failure, or something like temperature that leads to an electrical failure. 
So we have this, we need to see the whole environment. We need to see everything that's going on. So we have a chassis. We can measure a lot of channels very accurately from a wide variety of sensors. That's your sales pitch. Let's get into the good stuff. Um, so let's, let's start with a review of our permanent magnet construction or our permanent magnet motor construction. So we start with laminated steel core. So we have these stacks of laminations that are pressed together. Um, and these are coated in enamel to be separated from one another electrically. We then have copper windings that go in the slots of this motor. The copper is the active thing that's creating the torque. We then have some sort of bearing or in, in, in rotor hub. Um, we then have rotor laminations that have these magnets pressed into them. Again, another set of bearings and, and some support assembly. So what can go wrong? What can break in the system? Well, it's pretty simple. It can be the laminations, the windings, the bearings, or the magnets. <laughs> Um, but, but that's the beauty of the motors, is there's not that many parts, so it is quite simple. We can see things like the rotor laminations shorting together or, or the laminations becoming uh, peeling off and delaminating. Um, these windings are also coated in enamel and electrically separated. We can have the breakdown of the enamel and get turn to turn shorts. We can have bearing currents or bearing failures or misalignments. And then my personal favorite, we can have a whole variety of issues with the magnets. So let's look at some of these failures more in depth now that you're all experts on motor construction. So where can things fail? And I, I briefly went through this. So basically electric machine faults go into two categories. We have stator faults. This is short circuits between um, the windings. This is open circuits where, where maybe something becomes undone. And this is turn to turn shorts within the rotor. This is the windings rubbing together or, or overheating and melting and shorting. We also have rotor faults, which this is what we're going to talk about mostly in the production environment. So we have electrical rotor faults. This is if it's an induction machine, a broken cage, a broken magnet, demagnetization. This really has to do with the mechanical elements of the rotor. On the mechanical side, we have eccentricities, misalignments, and the bearings. So again, it's, it's a simple list of things. We can really reasonably test for this in a production environment. So how do these faults break down? Now, this is a study by IEEE and EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, on where fault failures in motors come from. Now, this was predominantly focused at industrial machines. But interestingly enough, what the feedback we're getting from the audio, auto manufacturers in the field this is field failures, is that it's really consistent with this. We're seeing a lot of bearing failures. We'll talk about that in a moment. We're seeing a you know, notable number of, of stator failures. We're seeing a small but notable percentage of rotor failures. And this is actually probably a lot higher in the EVs because of the number of permanent magnet motors in uh, the world for, for electric vehicles. And then other, and, and, and this is you know, a miscellaneous group. So this is pretty interesting. We, we really kind of have these three flavors of, of failure. So let's look at these in a little more detail. So bearing currents. Bearing currents are, are one of my, I think, the most interesting failures we have uh, because they're just so quirky and it truly is electromechanical. So we have the excitation on the stator. We have the three phase windings on the stator, which are interacting with the magnets on the rotors. So what we have is this magnetic field in the air gap, and some of that is leaking into the rotor. And the rotor builds up this charge. We have electrons that get trapped on the rotor. And this charge level builds up, and we end up with a voltage difference between the rotor and the stator. And as we all know, voltage wants to go from high potential to low potential, and it sees the bearing. And if this is ball bearings, or this is a fluid filled bearing, Eventually, there might be some sort of touching, rubbing, shorting, where boom, this charge sees a current, it sees a path to ground, and it escapes. And it comes through that bearing. So this is caused by ground currents, this is caused by rotor eccentricity, but, but it's voltage building up on the rotor. And this happens in every motor. Permanent magnet, induction, wound field, does not matter. Um, 
so we get these like lightning bolts running through the through the road or excuse me through the bearings and this cooks the ball bearings this cooks the fluid if it's the fluid bearing so we we get this effect of race fluting fluid insulation breakdown breakdown bearing pitting bearing failure and it ends up wobbling and it ends up being a, a, a fairly long fairly traumatic failure um so there's a whole bunch of ways we can measure this. I'll let you guys read the, the slides afterwards if you want, but we can basically measure the voltage on the, the rotor through some brushes. And if we're clever, we can measure the discharge current. But what we find is that this results in the bearings heating up. This resolves in a higher frequency of these discharges. So once it starts to discharge, this failure gets worse and worse over time. So when I talked about that recorded data, you might want to measure at the beginning and then, you know, a uh, uh, hundred hours from now and see has my frequency of discharge increased or not. So there's definitely ways we can measure for this. And this is in the R&D setting and we can understand what is good and what is bad. So when we go to production, we can spin up and identify things like uh, eccentricity. We can identify, um, you know, uh, uh, grounding situations. So this is the first failure, bearing currents. Charge builds up on the rotor, it finds a path to ground, and it cooks the bearing. And again, this is one of those electromechanical failures. We have electricity coming from the stator to the rotor that results in overheating and misalignment of a rotor. So it ends up in vibration, it ends up in, in heat. I think that's very interesting, the things we can monitor for things like bearing currents, or at least their effects. Your second failure, turn to turn shorts or inner turn shorts as I, I think the, uh, the formal name for them is. Now on the right hand side, some of you might recognize this as a um, three phase motor diagram or the circuit diagram for a three phase motor. So here's the different types of shorts we can have. We could have an open circuit, not super interesting and, and not so likely. We could have turn to turn shorts where within a phase two turns maybe rub together or get hot and the enamel breaks down and short together. We could have coil to coil where different windings that might be overlapping short together. We could have phase to phase shorts where maybe two, uh, again, windings in, in the, um, the stator housing rub together, get overheated, or phase to ground where maybe the, the coils short to the, um, to the stator housing, to the actual laminations. These all have different flavors of interesting, but, but a lot of the effects are the same. So the fault is that these windings short together or short to ground uh, with a breakdown of the winding enamel. Um, there could also be shorting of, of the inverter switches. What's the cause? Now, this is often a mechanical event that results in a electrical failure. Could be mechanical stress. And again, when we go to talk about production, Think about that there's a machine that's physically winding these stators. There could be rubbing. If that machine is off, you could be scraping windings, scraping that enamel, creating a situation for shorts. Electrical stresses, if that enamel gets too hot and starts to thin out, the breakdown voltage could, could become quite high or it could become quite low and we could end up with shorting. And then probably the most common is thermal stresses. These machines get run too hot, the enamel starts to break down, boom, we have turn to turn shorts. And if you're running machines that are outside of automotive, maybe in more extreme environments, um, you know, this can become quite real quite quickly. The effect, inefficiency, you know, they're, they're, these are quite traumatic failure as many people will, will like to bring up when I present this. But the thing is, is there are, you know, a handful of milliseconds or even sometimes seconds where we can identify that something is going to happen and compensate for it in control. So the effect is inefficiency, you know, demagnetization, and, and then smoke and fire, because once these take off, they go, especially if the root causes thermal. Now on the measurement side, um, we want to understand what leads to the failure. You know, so we can monitor things like zero sequence currents, we can monitor, monitor harmonic amplitudes, and we can monitor temperatures. And you know, in, in a couple of seconds beforehand, and if it's a thermal, maybe minutes beforehand, we can really start to see, is this all going to happen? If we can understand why it happens, 
we can understand what to look for in production. So keep that in mind. Demagnetization. Ah, this is this is a fun one because it's a little quirky. And if you're not used to motors, it, I, I apologize in advance. So for those of you who are not super well versed in in uh, magnetics, a magnet is not born a magnet. It's a combination of metals that we have to make a magnet. So when we make it a magnet, we pulse a huge current at it, we align all the dipoles, and it is now a magnet. But it doesn't always stay that way. So what I have in my top is, is a little graph. It's a, a BH curve. So what this basically says is if my magnetic strength with zero current is, you know, what, what do we have? About one Tesla. As I put negative field, or what we would call negative d-axis current, or let's just call it negative current, in the direction of the magnet, it becomes less of a magnet. Any of you have heard the term field weakening? This is field weakening. We push negative current at the magnet to make it look weaker. Now we do have this thing called the knee point, where here it's about 750 amps, where if I push more than 750 amps at this magnet, it hits this knee point where it can no longer recover. So we hit this demagnetization and then we have a new curve. And now my peak is you know, somewhere in, in the like 0.1 Tesla area. So we have this, this reduced magnetic strength that happens just from normal operation. Now the really fun part is this curve or, or, or this uh, uh, Curie temperature as we might call it, um, this curve changes with thermal. So as these magnets get hot, this knee point is gonna suck in. It's gonna come down to you know, 600 or 500 amps where we really threaten demagnetization with normal operation. So while the machine's rotating, if we go into field weakening and the machine's too hot, we can potentially turn our motor into a paperweight. So this can definitely happen in the field and this can definitely happen if in production. So the fault magnets lose strength, or more interestingly, if our magnets have a really specific shape, we could actually alter the magnetic shape and then not hit our performance goals. And then we have these symmetric or asymmetric um, demagnetization where is one magnet demagnetized or are all magnets demagnetized? The cause, overheating, conflicting magnetic fields. And if we have faults in the stator, we might accidentally pulse a huge amount of current at the rotor and demagnetize it. So faults from other sources can cause demagnetization. Now, I haven't said it yet, but some of you are probably thinking, hey, this is a mechanical thing like current, or excuse me, a mechanical thing like temperature that affects my magnetic strength, which affects my motor performance. This is mechanical affecting electrical. Which I guess then is again affecting mechanical in the torque and speed. So what's the effect? The effect is increased torque ripple, reduced power, because if we don't have a strong magnet, we can't make the same power, and an imbalance in line currents. And on the, I apologize for how, how busy this chart on the bottom right is, but it's three different machine types, um, which were had no demagnetization, had a symmetrical demagnetization and an asymmetrical demagnetization. And we can see it's only like a 2% or a 3% demagnetization for these cases. So it's pretty minor. And what we see is for the same power output, you know, we see an 8% increase in current. For the same power output, we see a reduction for this given machine and an increase in others in the torque ripple. For the other, for the other machine types, you know, we see a 27% increase in current to make the same power. We see a 117% increase in torque ripple. So these are things we can definitely monitor for and things we can very easily look for in production. And what we'll see in production is we actually end up looking at the back EMF, which will tell us more about the current and, and the torque ripple. And to monitor for these, we can look at our negative d-axis current, we can look at our line currents, we can look at our torque amplitude and torque ripple. So I think this is pretty cool because 
we can start to understand with recorded data of electrical and mechanical, what our faults are, what causes them, characterize them, maybe improve them, and then go to production where we can implement that. So um, I'm running a little short on time, so I will, I will speed up, but I don't have that much left. Um, so here is my example. I made a little dyno with two power tool motors. Uh, in one motor, I induced a short circuit, and in another motor, I induced demagnetization by, by overheating the rotor and pulsing a bunch of current at it. So test procedure, um, I characterize the motor in the healthy state, I characterize the short circuit, I characterize the demagnetization. Uh, I measured and recorded just the three phase voltages and the three phase currents, but I calculated RMS, power, reactive power, THD, uh, and my zero sequence voltage. So let's look at the results. So I ran a variety of speeds, measured the power, and what we see is for the short circuit, it's really easy to identify. Um, my, my healthy motor is in the blue and my short circuit phases are, are the colorful ones. And we can just see my RMS current is all over the place in the, um, in the short circuit to make the same power. Um, if we look at the zero sequence current, this is also all over the place in the instance of the short circuit. So it's really easy to identify these short circuits and in production, we can very simply measure it as well. More interestingly might be the demagnetization. So here, my colorful ones are the demagnetized, my blue ones are the healthy motor. And we can see for a slight demagnetization, we can actually see a pretty significant increase in voltage for a given power operation. So this is pretty easy to measure. We can just look at our RMS voltage and say, hey, this is increased. For a given machine, we can identify failure modes. Um, for the reactive power, this also, once we hit a certain frequency and that inductance changes, we can see our reactive power go way up for that, for that demagnetized motor. So I think this is pretty cool. These are simple calculations, simple measurements. We're in the field or during a, a durability test, we can start to identify things that are going wrong. So we've now gone over testing faults and we're familiar with some of our faults. Let's look at complex motor topologies. So there's a push in, in motors to use more unique magnets. This is for control reasons. This is for power output reasons. And what we see is we have people kind of creating shapes with the magnets. This creates a magnetic shape in our air gap and allows us to do more control. This can result in multiple magnets, different shapes of magnets, different angles of magnets, uh, and even spatially different magnet um, sizes. Now, for you who might be testing in production or looking at failures, what does this mean? Well, this means the magnetic shape in the air gap is different. And this gets indicated to us by the back EMF. So if you look at my graph on the right for four different magnetic shapes, these are basically four different angles of magnet. We can see our back EMF changes pretty drastically between the four different shapes. And if we look at these back EMFs from the harmonic spectrum, we can see we have a big fundamental and then we have different third harmonics, different fifth harmonics. And motors like D1, have a pretty significant third, fifth, seventh, 11th, or excuse me, ninth, 11th. These are things we can start to identify in production. We can start to look at these back EMF shapes and say, is this motor good or bad? Now, um, again, I'm gonna go quickly. I apologize. I, I, I tried to be a little aggressive here. Um, so historically, many people have done a, a pretty simple back EMF test where they look at peak voltage, and frequency to get to test their rotor, test the magnets in their rotor for quality. So this in these complex motor topologies might not hold true because if I look at my two shapes I have here, I have one that has a significant amount of harmonic in the fifth and one that has almost no harmonic in the fifth. They have the same peak voltage, but very different wave shapes. So in the red, peak voltage might not tell us if it's failed because what if these shoulders simply aren't there because the magnet was chipped or the magnet was magnetized funny. So we need a combination of calculations. We need to understand area under the curve as well as peak 
as well as maybe even wave shape or different harmonic functions of that wave shape. With a combination of these, we can start to tell pass fail for even these more complex motors that might have a higher harmonic spectrum in their back EMF. And if we look at this simple kind of chart, the good motor and the failed motor, um, you know, peak voltage 6.5, 6.5, area under the curve, uh, 1.68.198. So peak voltage tells us almost nothing, but something like our harmonic could tell us quite a bit. So eDrive offers real-time calculations for harmonics, area under the curve, KE, lambda, angle offset, and more, because a lot of times peak voltage is not good enough for these new motors. Um, a test might look like this for, for testing a back EMF. You might have an assembly line, drive motor, and inverter. Your rotor under test comes in. You put it into a test stator. You spin it up. You measure your three-phase voltages. You measure your position sensors. You send that data to a PC or execute in the real time. All these harmonic, peak, KE, flux equations. And then your PC or hardware gives you a pass-fail back to the assembly line for production. And you can really rip through these tests understanding are my magnets magnetized correctly. And again, just repeating that, you know, your test rig places your rotor into your stator, you spin up the rotor. In many of our test scenarios, we're only measuring for 0.1 second. We do all that data processing and a computer, you know, or, or the hardware makes a decision pass or fail. And we can store that data so we can archive if that pass or that fail. We can hold all of that data for your quality control team. So I think that's kind of exciting. We can record that data for passes or fails so you can understand trending on things like your rotor quality. And I think this is my last slide. Uh, um, so here is an example of a test where we have stored data for our waveform shape. Uh, that's my three phase voltages. We have our position sensor, which is black, indicating where, where the, the, the feedback sensor is. So we're looking at alignment to the back EMF. We're measuring or monitoring harmonics, amplitude and, and of certain frequencies. We're looking at the area under the curve. We're looking at the wave shape and we're making a decision. Do we pass an angle? Do we pass on KE? Do we pass on harmonic or polarity? And do we total pass or fail? So we can display that data, store that data, uh, and give you a pass-fail for a production environment. So conclusion, uh, motors have uh, uh, you know, different variety of failure modes. Um, motor durability and pr uh, production can be characterized with electrical measurements. And HBK offers a variety of tools for durability, for production, all of your scenarios are a little unique, so please contact us and we would be happy to discuss um, your specific needs. Um, with that, here are my references um, and thank you for your time. If you'd like to learn more about our product, please scan this with your phone or um, you know, we can take a discussion later. And I think we're doing questions after Christoph and Thomas's presentation. Thank you so much, sorry for going fast. So now I will invite Christoph and Thomas to share the screen and start their presentation on structural durability of electric vehicles and battery packs. So welcome everybody to um, the next stage here in the presentation round. Now we're talking about battery and battery electric vehicle structural durability validation. And we'd like to talk over the complete um, workflow from simulation to physical testing and data correlation. Quick look into the agenda. So we warm you up with a little bit of an intro. Um, you've seen Mitch presentation coming from the motor side. So this one basically is talking about battery. Um, we'll go into the V cycle in structural design and validation, talking about FMEA, fatigue life simulation, material characteristics, the mission load profile design, physical testing, measurement data analysis, correlation of simulation and physical testing data and outlook towards reliability. So there's a lot in. Uh, we'll 
end up with a summary and then we start the feedback round discussion questions around everything around um, battery then and also about e-drive and end of line testing so as a quick intro this is has been my starter since last five years actually electrification of vehicles all over so basically everything rolling propelling in air or water uh, is going to be electrified and the main pitch at the moment is a lithium ion battery um, solid state on the horizon though and um, obviously electric drives uh, in all form and shapes uh, out of the engineering field of compromises basically uh, we said okay we're going to pick for this presentation uh, at least five of them one is improved packaging size and weight is a topic minimum lifetime of 10 years and no callbacks uh, so basically a high reliable and durable product comply to global standards and laws is also a topic as an example transporting lithium ion batteries uh, needs some um, 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 compliance here and then design solution to target cost is a big topic and also stay within budget and time during development and validation so we picked the blue ones uh, for this presentation the battery pack um, explaining the battery pack is really complex we see uh, from a market trend that basically everything was what was in the combustion engine environment um, some um, years ago um, now move basically on complexity to the battery stack and and we picked the audi rs e-tron gt here um, 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 platform to basically explain it bottom up so you have a lower production cover on the lower end and then you have a really complex cooling system there's a lot missing here as well then you have a battery frame um, um, mainly the, the carrier for that battery pack uh, you have um, cell modules here with uh, 12 pouch cells in it and in total uh, 33 cells uh, 33 modules going up to a overall voltage level of 800 volts and then you ba basically on the top you have um, the high voltage battery control unit um, the battery management system also called uh, on this each one but you see the complex is uh, complexity is high it has a lot of parts a lot of um, 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 joints, um, um, a lot of combinations which needs to be tested here. So the battery is truly a multi-physics validation playground um, and, and this goes into all domains. Um, basically you need disciplines in mechanical, structural, mainly uh, talking here in this presentation. It is an electrochemical because of battery. It is at the end electrical um, with a, a high voltage output, um, um, some tell about 1200 volt batteries coming up on the horizon. There is definitely a thermal issue because lithium ion batteries, they all want to have it comfortable. Uh, best um, is between 15 and 25 degrees C. And it's a lot about electronics, functional software around this battery management system. And when it comes to engineering a battery, we basically simula see simulation virtual testing in all domains as well. We, we see simulation in mechanical. This is what we speak about here in this presentation. We see simulation in electrical, in thermal, and also in functional and software. And battery pack and BEV lab testing is also quite intense. We see standardized environmental tests. We see the structural durability lifetime test, what we talk about here. We see a combined testing here as well. Uh, combined means then uh, the battery pack is put on, a, for example, a shaker or a six stuff platform or a full scale uh, platform and on top uh, a climate chamber um, and in addition uh, electrical charge and discharge to really uh, um, simulate the um, environment of the battery. And you have electric use case um, um, testing. Uh, typical load profiles, lifetime testing, charge, discharge, and so forth. And there's a lot of misuse and abuse tests. Um, and also um, integration tests. We see tests, dynos, for example, also including the battery, meanwhile, or other subcomponents sub like an HVAC, um, um, so climate control. And, and also the battery management system, the electronics and software testing in hardware and loop systems is a uh, basically a lab test in its own. And still, 
mobile testing is still necessary to basically do road low data acquisition, crash testing, NVH, ride and handling, and also WLTP testing, um, basically at the end of the, um, of the validation period. So in all these domains, basically, the message here is also HBK can deliver a solution. But we are now concentrate on mechanical structural durability um, in this presentation. So let's go into that structural durability validation um, 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 workflow wh where HBK has quite a unique um, solution offering. And this starts typically with a mule um, in doing load acquisition in the field, improving grounds on road also. Um, and it's called road load data acquisition. So it's basically an instrumented vehicle um, going on certain, uh, um, get, acquiring certain load profiles. And then it goes, all this data goes into data analysis, um, um, finding some statistics, uh, calculating something like a damage factor, preparing the complete data sets towards a golden file. Uh, others call it mission profile. So basically a load representation to the vehicle. And this goes into lab testing, uh, into a bench test. And, and all single parts are tested in the durability um, lineup, but also full scale vehicles. But also the data goes into simulation, into fatigue uh, life simulation based on FAE or multi-body simulation. And so this data and the vi virtual testing basically goes also back to data analytics, where you have the chance to correlate this virtual testing simulation with real world testing data, or add virtual sensors data into real world data in case of missing sensors. So there's a lot in it, um, but it's basically at the end, a lot about data analytics. Message here is that HBK can basically deliver the whole setup here in that scenario. Going over to um, the first section, computer edit engineering, FMEA, lifetime simulation, where I'd like to hand over to my colleague here, Thomas. Okay, thanks, Christoph. And yeah, now it's, uh, it's my part and we'll see how we can help you. So um, to uh, describe or introduce it to our solutions, we decided to uh, use this V model for development and validation processes. And this describes a process from very early design phases, like the concept phase even, moving over to a virtual testing and simulation methods. And then once we have the first prototype, we also look into testing, full-scale testing, validation tests, finally, till we have the start of production. But now let's have a look at the very early design phase where HBK offers some tools for FMEA, uh, the uh, failure mode and effects analysis. Okay, so failure mode and effects analysis is done uh, uh, with HBK's XFMEA software. And uh, the software offers you the possibility to do uh, FMEAs on a design process and a system level. You can do risk assessments and uh, design reviews based on the failure modes you're looking at. Every user can have his uh, dashboard um, to be up to date with all the information um, in the system. And also the software takes care about the data management so that you can easily work across uh, different departments uh, with lots of colleagues involved in the development process and maybe even with suppliers. And also the software uh, supports a lot of standards for FE, FMEA analysis, where there is the SAE standards, ISO, VDA, MIL standards. Um, uh, and so within the software, we can follow the rules coming from these standards. Okay. The next step now is uh, what we call virtual testing or lifetime simulation still completely in the virtual world without any physical prototype. And one thing which is also very important when we talk about lifetime and fatigue simulation, it's a characterization of materials. And also here, HBK has some solutions for you. When we are talking about uh, fatigue analysis, 
um, what, what we are aiming at is high quality results of the simulated lifetime. And uh, when we are need uh, high quality results, of course, we need uh, high quality inputs. And for fatigue analysis, there are three basic inputs. At this stage, when we're talking about geometry, we are talking about a finite element model of your component or systems. We need materials data for the fatigue analysis. And at this stage, we also need a mission profile, a load profile to calculate um, the life, the expected life. And this is done with our software design life, which we're looking at now in a bit more detailed. Okay. So uh, design life is our tool for virtual fatigue testing using the results from finite element uh, analysis. And even if we were talking about uh, the virtual world here, we can make use of physical measured uh, road load data that can be applied to our virtual model to calculate um, the expected lifetime. And we can do that, of course, for the stress and strain life fatigue, but we also offer solvers for seam and spot welds, uh, vibration fatigue, uh, fatigue at elevated temperatures, high temperature fatigue. Also composites can be analyzed with design life uh, as well as adhesive joints. And besides all these uh, fatigue solvers, uh, design life offers some great uh, features. And I would like to highlight here the ability to apply virtual sensors on our um, virtual component which means we can apply strain gauges, accelerometers, or a virtual displacement sensor on our component. And why this is important, we'll see on the next slide. Um, so in, in the first instance, the virtual sensors uh, can be used um, to, to find the optimal sensor locations and even the software design life will help you in finding those locations. This is especially important if we think about a model analysis, where we need to capture all the different mode shapes that uh, occur during operation of our component. And of course, once we have found the um, optimized sensor positions, um, we can apply them once we have a real prototype and then correlate the data we collect in the field testing with our virtual simulations to even improve uh, the quality of the simulations. Okay. And uh, to do so, as I said uh, a few minutes before, material data is a very important input to our fatigue calculations. And here, HBK can support you in characterizing the materials um, of interest. So first worth mentioning is that we deliver our uh, hardware like the Quantum X and the Catman uh, to be integrated in testing machines, may it be from SWIG, MTS, or Instron, and in this way, help our customers with material characterization. The other very important point is that we ship a materials database with our design life software. So the software already comes with, I would say about 200 materials and uh, all the parameters you need for a fatigue calculation. And uh, the last part, and I think HBK is there uh, unique on the market. We own our own test facility where we offer material characterization as a service. So we can derive the materials parameter for all the fatigue models we use in our software, but and we can also include um, the effects of surface treatments of these components or materials. And we can also include effects uh, that are introduced due to the production process. And this is not only done to be then part of a materials database, but uh, this is also done for a lot of our customers to assure 
their quality a stable high quality of material and it gives uh, it is a good way to compare the quality of different suppliers and uh, i think that's the end of my part first off now we hand over to the physical testing bit very well introduce now the first prototypes great thanks thomas so we we now have the first prototypes built because um, uh, design life and uh, durability um, um, analysis showed where to improve for example material uh, thickness of the material and uh, st or stiffness or whatever and we have a first prototype um, built now and now we go into physical testing um, but before we go into physical testing <clears throat> i'd like to go a little bit back to virtual testing simulation supporting the left arm of the v cycle with some real road load data and this is like this you to get true measurement data from proving grounds of fields we go now from simulated and virtual strain gauges over to real strain gauges and real acceleration transducers uh, at their suggested measurement locations so in best case um, uh, the software names you the perfect location for the strain gauge for example and then you basically measure the, measure it with a quantum mix which is a non-ruggedized unit or the ruggedized somatics r uh, data acquisition system and then you go with all this data into um, glyphworks like shown and glyphworks the, the software basically does all this pre-processing of data um, towards this golden file and you can basically have a, a mouse click um, report from this. And the result of this, of this um, technique acquiring all these Belgian blocks and cross country and motor vibration, whatever signals, is basically to get that golden load profile out of um, this, um, uh, this process and to feed it into, again, back to the simulation and to um, testing machines in lab. How does it look like this road load data acquisition system? So this is the filled trunk here of a, I think it was a is a Volkswagen, and uh, this there comes HBK Somatic XR into play. So um, the good thing here is it supports all common sensor technologies um, you find that in that field. It's truly ruggedized when it comes to shock vibration, temperature range, dew point resistance, water dust. Uh, so it's one of the most ruggedized duct systems in the world. You can scale up to a thousand channels, we always say, but there's basically no limit. Uh, you can go up to 100 kilo sample per sec per channel. It's truly distributable, uh, not so interesting for a passenger car, but for a bus or truck or military vehicle, it is really interesting. Um, the, the advantage of distributable is short sensor lines. Uh, it has unique universal inputs, so you're really flexible and, and efficient in setting up um, basically every measurement you like. Uh, it has outstanding bridge un um, inputs. Um, it works plug and measure, so you can work with TETS technology. So the sensor comes with a data sheet and you plug and play basically. It has a powerful recorder with up to five mega samples, some data rate. It supports all um, vehicle buses um, with CAN, CAN FD, XCP on CAN, um, but also XCP on Ethernet. So you can basically also integrate it into tools like um, um, Inca, Canapé, and so forth, or uh, into test benches. So this is what a typical setup looks like. Um, here on this um, page, um, customers want to acquire position um, um, by GNSS or by even kinematics with measuring in, by, by an inertial measurement unit. Um, cameras are always equipped, um, front and rear facing cameras to get a picture of the scenario. If this is in field, for example, um, sensors and signals, all kind, acceleration, strain, displacement, Wheel force transducers is, a, is an important fact. Um, so we can integrate all kinds of wheel force transducers um, from Michigan, Kistler, and so forth, uh, linking up to CAN, CAN FD, getting also the vehicle bus data. And then the Ethernet line is, is, is dotted here because it's not necessary. The Somatics are data recording systems, basically um, 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 autonomous recording data in itself. And, can be scaled up um, to any input. And then the creation of the golden load profile is basically done by HPK Glyphworks here, uh, our data analytics platform. I picked out 
only one amplifier um, of the Somatics R to just make it simple and, and lean. And this is uh, our flagship um, bridge amplifier here. So it is basically not only a bridge amplifier, it's also somehow universal measuring voltage, uh, temperature by uh, PT100 resistance, can also measure displacement. For example, we see this um, on, on the four corners, um, displacement measurement between um, a wheel force and um, chassis by potentiometers. You can measure a full bridge strain gauge with four or six wire technologies measuring forces, pressure, acceleration, uh, half bridges, but also quarter bridges. Unique thing of, of this um, Somatix R amplifier is it basically um, supplies DC excitation voltage, but also alternating carrier frequency excitation voltage, suppressing electromagnetic magnetic noise, which is an important factor in electric vehicles. Uh, data rates go goes up to 20 kilo sample per sec per channel. This is just picking out one, um, uh, not the recorder, not the CAN-FD module, not the universal. So they are the most um, valuable here in, in road load data acquisition. Coming to the HBK sensor world, it is a unique uh, world in, its, in itself. Um, we have um, strain gauges, um, we have acceleration transducers, displacement transducers, microphones, acoustics, and there's a few more, but I picked only the most relevant in this world, um, RLDA, road load data, because in durability and a little bit dynam dynamics. Um, but the strain gauge portfolio is, is quite unique. Um, and, and we could recommend to use, for example, here in RLDA or in general durability, the Y series. So you will find the Y series in all um, geometry and designs, um, non pre-wired, so as low as standalone or pre-wired um, option basically saves you a lot of time in setting up um, the strain gauge. So it is basically easy to install. We have a lot of special strain gauge setups here encapsulated for PCB testing, uh, for composite material, uh, welding strain gauge, or integration into bolts, um, uh, measuring here also um, um, strain or force at the end then um, if you fix something. And basic, basically HBK wants to be here the one-stop shop. So quick curing adhesives, uh, covering agents, solar terminals, not to speak about the trainings, how to, um, um, to apply strain gauges or the service um, that somebody comes in to your company's company and applies the strain gauge and sets up the measurement chain. So um, the strain gauge portfolio from HPK is quite unique. So you will find um, your proper solution here, measuring strain and then uh, going into basically um, electronics and software uh, to um, go from strain to stress. The measurement spots in an EV vehicle, vehicle and on a battery is quite um, extensive. Um, we have customers using up to 30 strain gauge rosettes inside the battery frame. You've seen it, for example, for the, the if you remember, the Audi um, um, housing is quite um, um, huge. Um, and also up to 30 strain gauge rosettes outside of the battery. The best location find is comes in best case from HBK Design Life and your experience. For example, in comparison to older job to, to um, in the past, um, applying the strain gauge rosettes on the right hand side, you see something um, um, pretty loose. There's better applications in the market for sure. So this is about strain gauge applications here. Going into the DAQ software then, bridging over the electronics here, um, our software Catman AP supports structural durability and has a lot of the features to offer. So it runs mobile, your mobile testing, road load data acquisition, but it also runs in bench, bench testing. You have an online rosette calculation. So you basically see instantly principal stress, angle, and so forth. So there's about 10 parameters you can click on or off. You can calculate strain to stress. Uh, you can do strain gauge temperature compensation um, um, right online. You do, can do online data classification, uh, cycle counting, for example, when it comes to test bench um, um, implementation, a multi recorder if you want to monitor, for example, um, something, a vehicle with 100 samples per sec, and then something happens, you can. Uh, push up to 20,000 samples per sec. So multi-recorder is, is often needed and also script automation uh, during um, um, runtime. So Catman brings all um, the visualizations and the math 
to uh, in structural durability you need and it's quite um, established in that field. Going over to system integration test, now the right arm. So now we have a prototype available of a battery or of a complete battery electric vehicle. And now we come with um, um, a setup in a bench environment. And again here, um, you need to measure, you need sensors, you need electronics, software, uh, you need perhaps a shaker um, in, in component testing um, or fully integrated into a component test setup. And this is, can be complex, but it can be also simple. I chose the, the complex world. So let's, let's say um, there's a shaker and component test stand. There's also vibration tables, six stuff platforms you perhaps know from, from, from MTS. Uh, there's bed place, load frames, dampers, ball joints. So there's all kind of testing, tires, steering, drive line. There's all diff um, different test setups, all with the purpose to basically replay the golden file according to overall lifetime. And now you basically verify or validate if your um, assumption of, the, of your lifetime is basically true or if you see weaknesses in the overall setup in the, in the component or in a material compared to your simulation. And the measurement quantities are basically always the same. It's force measurements, strain, acceleration, displacements, the typical quantities uh, where to put it basically to the same um, um, positions um, in like in a de um, design life gives you and like acquired in road load data acquisition. So you can basically match it uh, real data to, um, to component testing data. But what we see in component testing and also in full-scale testing that in lab testing environment, something like over something to five times more sensors are acquired. And it's, it's, it's not unusual that we see sometimes up to uh, 50, 60 sensors in, in a component test and in a full-scale test up to 200, 300 sensors. Uh, just to make sure um, um, that the simulation and um, that the, the system um, is the correct one. Um, in the test specimen analyzer data acquisition, you have basically online visualization, data acquisition, analysis running, and normally the data is pushed to um, something like a data analysis platform um, or also to a data analysis, um, to a data management platform like Akira to basically the idea is here to correlate um, the, the tests um, um, data with the simulation data. Going over to the full scale tests, um, again, same picture, just scaled up um, um, sensors, DAQ software fully integrated into test machines uh, in that um, setup of a battery electric vehicle is basically the same setup. Um, what we see here is four posters, multi-actual road simulators. It's a bit more complex because you have wheel force transducers um, for static use um, as well in the picture is a little bit more channels um, and it's um, more complex, like I said. Uh, and this is normally today really real-time ethernet integrated um, over ethercut, whereas we see in component testing of an um, um, also stimulation and will out a real-time loop. So here it comes the real-time loop into play. So the, the, the data acquisition system is basically interlinked with the real-time test control. And there we can say what we are basically integrated into MTS, um, Instron, MOOC, and all the players uh, via EtherCAT. And in the same way up over ethernet to test specimen analysis, um, um, creating files, which go then again into data uh, analysis and correlation. So basically the same setup, validating um, the parts um, here, the full scale um, um, life cycle. Summary, structural durability validation um, of um, basically high performance batteries is one of the major parts in a battery electric vehicle. Optimizing, validating its mechanical and structural design is, is key. Simulation, what you've seen now, a high accuracy measurement and physical testing and data correlation prototype phase has basically the potential to reduce product failure, reduce warranty and service costs, and improve performance and reliability. 
and the HBK toolchain supports you in basically getting the data you can trust, uh, speeding up your validation process because of the seamless um, toolchain um, from simulation to physical testing. And so you can quickly adapt to changes and building up your own data management tool and compare, for example, to the last project and so forth. Okay, and also a little wrap up uh, from my side. I hope it was uh, clear or I hope it could introduce you into our solutions for simulation and durability testing and how to speed up this validation process. And uh, nevertheless, it is from a, a cell over a battery pack or to the overall vehicle in basically all stages of the development process the HBK can can help you with a solution. And also maybe the yeah, a little outlook from my side. Um, with HBK's reliability software, you can analyze some of the KPIs of your vehicles or components or systems. And this software will help you then even in operation, in service, to quantify the system's reliability, it will help you to find even more potential for reliability growth, and it helps to optimize the maintenance, maintenance strategies, and all this together should lead into avoiding the high risk of battery failures. So that's from my side, thank you very much. And I think we are open for questions or discussion, yeah.